Bobby's mind before the weekend is consummated due to the fact that the weekend often isn't consummated, that is. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, all week you figure it's good. This, this is going to be a fantastic, you know. This, this is the final one that's going to make it. And if I roughly, uh, at two o'clock Sunday, you realize no way. It starts to slide downhill and it's, you know, just another one. And I'd like to tonight, uh, give you as a disclaimer a word here to the effect that certain portions of the following effort could very well be somewhat distasteful to many people. Now, that's right, that's right. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as, uh, you know, as I often say, I don't make the news, I only report it, you know. <laughs> I don't, I don't create the nuttiness. Nor, although the king's messenger always gets clobbered. Anytime you come and you lay the bad news on the people, who do they go after? They have, they go after the guy that comes with the bad news, you know. They don't, uh, they don't go out and do much about the problem. They go after the guy with the problem in his hand in the paper, you know. So, uh, no way. Uh, yeah. I think that's one of the reasons why guys are getting all mad at TV news. Cause it's always bad. <laughs> you know, they want to, they want to kill John Chamberlain or uh, Chancellor or something because, you know, he comes out with bad news. But, uh, yeah, that's the King's Messenger. It's called the King's Messenger Syndrome. You know, there's an actual syndrome? And, uh, yeah, well, you know, this is an old story. Uh, dictators are that way. I mean, a dictator, yeah, here he's, you know, here's Hitler sitting there or, uh, Castro or somebody, you know, he's in the throne room. And uh, everybody's scraping and bound and edging up to him, you know, very careful. And all of a sudden, this guy comes in, and uh, the bugles blow, and uh, they say, it is the messenger from the front. And uh, the, <laughs> the messenger says, oh, my God, we are in the, we, we are having a bad time out there in Africa. They're chasing us all over the lot. they got tanks, and they got guns and bombing and all this. And he says, what did you say? We are, we are, it's uh, terrible. we got to have more. We are losing. We are being chased. Oh, take him off with his head. That's exactly what happens. So don't come bearing bad news, kid. I mean, you may have, you know, you may have the truth, but don't bring it home. Because you'll ever get put right in the bottom half of the freezer. I mean, tied up like a Christmas turkey, Dad. Now, uh, as I say, though, we, tonight, uh, I have to take a little credit here. I think you were on with me, George. I don't know where you did this. Did, did you do this show? Remember when I said that, uh, remember, remember the movie, Willard? You remember that fantastic rap that was such a fantastic star in that movie? Well, didn't I predict that he would win awards? Remember I said that? Okay. Shepard once again has predicted the truth. And we have a note here. The Patsy, which is the equivalent of the Oscar. For the animals of show business. Did you know they have a thing called a patsy? Okay. Has been awarded by the American Humane Association to Ben. That spectacular rat who played in the movie Willard. He beat out three horses, a goose, eight ducks, an eagle, two cats, a raccoon, four chimps, a cougar, and a duck. And, uh, you know, and he won the trophy. What did he do? They put down the trophy next to him so the pictures could be taken. And what did he do? He's a rat. What did he do? He did it. That's right. <laughs> After all, he's a rat, you know. What are you going to? Uh, speaking of uh, of, of uh, Willard, you know, he's been he's been going bigger and bigger. For those of you who are not keeping up with the uh, with the rat world and with the movie star world, because he's a new movie star. Uh, Kuala Lumpur. We have a news note from one of our spies. By the way, one of my best spies lives in Canberra, in Australia. And about every six weeks, we get an entire compilation of the fantastic stuff in the far Pacific. Now, I've got a wide, you know, network, an underground network of spies. And uh, he sends this note to me from Kuala Lumpur. You know where that is, don't you? It's not far from Australia, man. To help publicize a film called Willard, which is about rats, a theater in Kuala Lumpur held a contest a couple of days ago to find the longest rat in the city. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody doing that here in a local theater? We don't have that kind of imagination. And uh, they they were going to give a prize to, uh, you know, the kid that brought in the, the greatest, biggest rat. Chow Lai Chan, a distant relative of Charlie, won a year's supply of admission tickets for two when he produced a rat 11 inches long minus its tail. That's a pretty good rat. But that ain't nothing, friends, if you think that's a good rat. 
Rangoon. Here's a note from Rangoon. Peasants in northern Burma are using bows and arrows against giant rats which have inundated the area and are destroying rice and maize crops. I mean, they're fighting them with bows and arrows there. One dead rat weighed 45 pounds. I repeat, one dead rat weighed 45 pounds. Now, 45 pounds, I mean, that's a rat. <laughs> oh, yeah, there were, cause there's all kinds of problems, you know, with animals these days. I mean, you know, the world is getting, is getting all, uh, you know, hung on animals in one way or another. Cause I think, I think the animal world is taking a different twist than it used to. And, uh, here's a note that, uh, you might, uh, find, uh, somewhat, uh, it, it tells a lot about, uh, a lot about alien cultures, you know? Uh, because, you know, each culture is different towards animals. It really is. Uh, for example, uh, it would never occur to, say, a guy running a theater in uh, the Bronx uh, to have a contest for the kid locally to bring in the biggest rat, which means that they have a different attitudes, apparently, towards rats in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> you agree? Well, all right, listen to this goodie. Uh, this is from Lagos. I was in Lagos, you know, uh, a few years ago. And uh, listen to this. Nigerian police have arrested a goat. For uh, now, that means they arrested him. Remember that? That's not uh, that wouldn't even be done here in this country, as far as I know. But they arrested a goat for suspected kidnapping. The animal was kept under observation at a police station in the Lagos suburb of Ikoya because a man believed to be a kidnapper was reported to have changed into a goat. Uh huh. Nigerian television showed films of the goat and of large crowds which gathered after it was detained. And the crowds all came to see this goat that was, you know, they put the arm on him. It says there's a kidnapping scare going on in Lagos. Four men have been stoned to death when suspected by onlookers of trying to entice away children. Kidnappers are widely believed to have supernatural powers, enabling them to charm children into following them or even change into animals when detected. So this goat, uh, you know, it's a guy, that, it's a disguise. He, uh, he, you know, changed into a goat. And uh, I don't blame him because I, I've, I've been followed by some very suspicious-looking dogs. Uh, and certainly I know of at least one cat that uh, displayed very uncat-like characteristics when pressed to the wall. I mean, it came damn near talking. But, uh, it, so, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm just, just reporting these things and I, Speaking of big rats, I shouldn't even tell you this story, you know, because most of you nice people here, uh, you know, live in the big city types and maybe in the elegant uh, apartments and that have never really seen a working rat. You know, I'm not talking about a working rat. I'm not talking about the little, the little kind they get in the pet store, you know, the kind of white mice and all that stuff. I'm talking about a rat, rat, a real rat. And uh, you're listening to a man who knows his rats. Now, I, I really do. I, I, uh, <laughs> I've had a checkered career, as you probably are aware, and uh, one of my most interesting jobs. You know, I heard a guy the other day being interviewed. He was a he was a football player, see, and uh, the uh, the interviewer says to him, uh, he says, uh, "Well, uh, uh, Big Charlie, uh, what are you going to do when you finish playing the big time in football?" He says, "Well, I'll get a job." So, well, what do you mean, get a job? <laughs> you know, says, uh, he, uh, he says, what kind of job are you going to get? He says, oh, I don't know. I'll land on my feet. He says, I'll get a job. And he says, I've had a lot of jobs before. Well, that surprised the interviewer. He says, you mean you've had jobs before? What, what did you do? He says, well, I worked in an SO station. And uh, I remember the time I, I worked in this hardware store once. I was, oh, it wasn't bad. And this kind of threw Kirk Gowdy, you know. He says, well, I'll be darned. Folks, it's amazing, but many athletes have had a career before they got into football. At that point, the interviewer said, uh, he says, what are you talking about? He says, everybody in the world's had all kinds of jobs before he got into what he's doing, you know? He says, what did you do, Cody? Did, did you start out full-blown, you know, blabbing away into a microphone about football games? What would you do? There was a long pregnant pause, at which point Gotti says, well, uh, yes, I did. Work. I worked in a meat market once, and the football player says, yeah, there you go. See, he says, everybody's had a job. Before, you know, everybody has. Now, I'm sure that, that, of course, the people in showbiz tend to keep this very secret. Unless it's a fashionable job. For example, if you once worked as a, uh, as a lumberjack, that's groovy. That's good. Oh, that's, that's the right thing. See, they could, oh yeah, that, 
But if you once worked, let's say, reading meters for the uh, for the Western Utah Power and Light Company, they never mention that. <laughs> That's not a popular job, you know. It's it's not a glamorous job. Well, every place I go, somebody asks me about the fact that I work in a steel mill. I did work in a steel mill, and 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 this this is popular. This is a, this is a considered a a rugged job, you know. Somehow, if you work in a steel mill. You know that's that, that that adds to the machismo. You know, that uh, that adds to the to the guts of what you're doing. You know, you've been down there with the people. Well, now they rarely ask me what I did in the steel mill because they always assume everybody who works in the steel mill does the same thing. You know, totes big chunks of iron around and uh, wears a big mask and hammers uh, pieces of uh, molten steel into uh, into rails or something like that. Well, I you know I did a lot of things uh, in the steel mill and and, and it, it, one job that I got, uh, I've never forgotten this job, and uh, this was in the steel mill, and uh, it's kind of a great job. Now that I look back, at the time, I, you know, I griped like mad, like, which is like the case of almost everybody uh, who has ever had other jobs. When you got the job, you gripe. Like this, this one time I'm sitting on the set, now listen carefully, friends, I'm sitting on the set with a major, probably one of the five or six I'd say one of the ten major leading male movie stars of our time, right? That's a, maybe he, and he does the kind of stuff that everybody secretly envies. Well, I'm sitting with this guy, and he says, you want to go out for coffee? And I said, yeah. So we go across the street to this restaurant. We're sitting in there having coffee. Nobody recognized him. And uh, he, he looks kind of, kind of bugged. And uh, I didn't say anything about him. I'm drinking coffee. This guy, I knew him, so he's a friend of mine. So we're drinking coffee. Finally, he comes out. He says, oh, God. He says, I'm getting so damn tired of this. I said, tired of it? What? He said, oh, God. He said, what a drag. I said, being a movie star is a drag. Oh. What a drag. Well, then he, yeah, then he began to pour it out, see, what was, you know, what was an unbelievable drag. And how he hated his job. How he hated the, all the guys. He says, if he, he says, if I, if I've got to listen to that guy, you know, he's, this guy pontificate, he says, what a bag of wind. If I have to listen to this guy another five minutes, I think I'm going to blow my gasket. He's talking about this famous director, you know, that everybody's always interviewing. He says, what a fake, what a phony. This guy's a fat head of the worst order. Oh, God, I hate this. I said, well, you know, you, you, you could have stayed at Macy's. So I wish I had. Do you know if I was at Macy's now today, I would be the head of the, of the, of the men's clothing department if I'd stayed? And you could see the regret in his eyes. Really was but. If I told you who it was, you wouldn't believe it. In short, what I'm saying is that no matter what job you have, you gripe. <laughs> I mean, it's a drag, which reminds me, this is W.O.R. New York. No, 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 I just, just looked up the clock, that reminded me. <laughs> uh, while, we're, <laughs> while we're on the subject of uh, getting down to work here, let's get to work here. Uh, sharpie has got a commercial. Would you hit the button, please? Please. It's a misty night. Walking along Cedar Street, hand in hand, are Andy and Betsy. You know what Andy's doing, besides being nervous about how he can kiss Betsy goodnight? <laughs> he's sneaking a lifesaver. And not even Betsy will know he snuck it until he kisses her. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Lemon, got another lifesaver? Girls are why boys should always carry plenty of lifesavers. Savers is a registered trademark. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't. La da Now we have a little note here to remind you that the House of Chan is still a superb restaurant, 
Uh, they have been for 35 years on the corner of 52nd Street and 7th Avenues, right in the heart of pulsating Manhattan. And if you're going to a theater or someplace, this is a little word here, if you're, you know, one of the big problems is to walk in, you're, you're going on a big, you know, going to the theater and you're going to have dinner or something before the show. Boy, I'll tell you, how many times have you bought a, a, a big expensive dinner and it arrives four and a half minutes before you got to leave? Uh, that has happened. And I would suggest that when you go to, to uh, they, they know all that problem, you know, there at the House of Chan. You just tell them you're going to the theater and they'll lay it on you fast and good. They will not ski. Yeah, they, they're good there. The, the, they're one of the best Chinese restaurants around. And they're at the corner of 30, they're at the corner of 52nd and 7th. And one point I want to make out here, and you, you, you're going to want to know, they got a bar. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, for those who like the bar in the back there, it's important. And uh, they got one. I'll just let you know. That's okay. You go there. <laughs> it's okay. It's uh, 52nd and 7th, right in the middle of everything here. The House of Chan. We were really leading a life of married singles. We were living two separate lives under one roof. Well, when I look back, I can see that our marriage had become stagnant. Many couples, like this husband and wife, have a nagging feeling that their marriages should be better. Now, thousands of couples on Long Island have experienced a new way of improving their lives together. It's called Marriage Encounter, and it's described this Sunday in Newsday's L.I. Magazine. How does Marriage Encounter work? How much does it cost? How can you participate? To find out, read The Weekend That Changes Marriages in Sunday Newsday. For another kind of help, a new series begins this Sunday in Newsday, a series that clearly shows how you can save money on your income tax. Two of many helpful and entertaining articles. The kind of articles that have made Newsday the number one Sunday newspaper on Long Island. Newsday. Long Island's own Sunday newspaper. Yeah, here's a little... Uh, yeah, this is a strange thing. This coming Sunday, January 21, is Ball Day at the Long Island Coliseum. If you buy a ticket for the New York Nets playing the Dallas Chaparrales, by the way, that day at 2.05 p.m., They'll be eligible to purchase an official size and weight Nets red, white, and blue basketball, which regularly sells for $6 for only two and a half. And you can see the Nets take on the chaparrales in the beautiful Long Island Coliseum. Never been out there. Off the Meadowbrook Parkway in Uniondale. And for only two dollars and a half, you can purchase an official Nets red, white, and blue regulation size and weight basketball. That's this Sunday, January 21, Long Island Coliseum at 2.05 p.m. The Nets versus the Chaparrales. Uh, that, you know, that's the ball that they use in the American Association, you know, that big red, white, and blue ball. And uh, I don't know how it would work on a pavement, but uh, <laughs> it's a regulation size, a regulation weight. And if you want to, you know, get out there and bounce a few off the backboards, this is the way to do it, man. Next Sunday, the 21st. But, uh, you know, uh, getting back to this uh, this rat scene, uh, I... I uh, so I'm I'm not the I'm I'm just like everybody else, you know. It's a it's a funny thing about once you have left a job, it may have been a real. There's only a couple of jobs that I've had in my life that I can look back on and say they were untotal, absolutely total drags. And at no point can I look back on them and say, you know, gee, that was kind of fun. You know, <laughs> no way. But uh, but things tend to soften. Uh, yeah, as you go away. And uh, they, you, you remember a lot of stuff that you didn't even notice much at the time. But uh, I was working the steel mill, see? And now, remember, I was a kid. You know, I was just a kid. I was about 16 at the time. It was the summertime. And uh, and I was uh, I was working as a as what they call a mail boy. Well, now, this is not what it sounds like. It's a, it's a highly complicated job, really, there. Because the mill covers about... Oh, well, figured out. There's, there's 27,000 guys work there. That was what the, the, the workforce was at the time. Three shifts. And it covers about, oh, about 100 square miles. It's a tremendous place. And the thing that a mail boy had to have, uh, after about four or five months of training, you could, you knew every last office, little tiny offices, little bitty weighing scale offices. You knew every place in the mill, like the back of your hand. And and even the uh, the important supervisors and the big superintendents didn't know that. Uh, they knew their own mill. But the mail boy knew every last thing about this place. It's a fantastic place. And it was it became very 
intimate to you. You know, every every place where hot air would come out and blast you in the back of the neck if you didn't look right. And uh, you know where to be careful and where not to be careful. You know where you could run, where you could walk and all this stuff. And, of course, you had a million different things happen to you. learning in the mill. And the, the whole idea is where were, where were they going to send you? See, they, they'd assign you to a job in a regular place once in a while. So one day down in the... Uh, down on the mail, I come back to the to mail room and Mr. Moss said, uh, uh, "Morning." I said, "Good morning, Mr. Moss." He said, I "Want you to come down and work in the tin mill for a while." I said, "Tin mill, because the tin mill is kind of the tin mill was like uh, every company has a special department that it's kind of groovy to work for. It's just like if you're in the in the Marine Corps, you know, there's certain places that are better than others. Uh, in the Army." I mean, if you, if you got in, if you got in, for example, if you got in the Air Force, that was kind of, it had a panache, you know. If on the other hand, you were assigned to the Quartermaster Corps, you know you'd be spending a lot of your time carrying around, uh, garbage cans and delivering stuff like, uh, clinkers for furnaces and stuff, you know, that kind of jazz. So, I said, the tin mill, Mr. Moss. Yep, he said, I don't know why they just called us, said they kind of like, yep, come down, and then once you go work down there in the tin mill sorting office. Well, I knew the tin mill sorting office. This was a very glamorous place. Now, why was it glamorous? Well, for one thing, it was indoors. That automatically made it glamorous because there's nothing worse than an outdoor office. Now, there are many outdoor little shacks, you know, sitting next to a railroad track with the sun beating down on the top of it, the temperature 140 degrees, counting railroad cars going back and forth and switching in and out. That's not the kind of glamour job you want. Well, the tin mill was particularly glamorous because the tin mill had thousands of girls working in it. Now, they worked in a department called the Tin Mill Assorting, see? And these chicks wore these blue uniforms, and they worked under fluorescent lights. And they would, they would, they would examine the big sheets of tin. Now, these pieces of tin were about, oh, 30 by 36. And they wore big gloves, and they'd flip them over like playing cards. I could still hear the sound of the of the tin being flipped, and they would flip it under these special lights, and they would look for flaws in the tin, see, and they go, and they would flash beautiful blue-green lights, and man, these chicks were something else. I mean, there were all kinds of fantastic girls working there. Uh, there were, you know, Polish, Lithuanian, uh, Hungarian chicks, you know, fantastic. They all looked, they all looked a little bit like uh, Sophia Loren's kid sister, you know, that kind Earthy peasants, see, <laughs> and they're from every time they would flip, they would radiate animal vitality. Well, I had been going past and through the tin mill now for about three months, running through the tin mill with my bag of mail over my shoulder, you know, running through there, and I'd see these girls, and right in the middle of all the girls, they were surrounded like a great field of of uh, of feminine passion, right in the middle of this field of chicks was this glass office. It was about, oh, maybe 40 feet by 25 feet, but it had glass windows all around it. And that was the tin mill assorting office. And I would come and I would deliver mail to this office, see? There was a guy named Chester there. Chester Gotch. And Chester was always, yeah, Chester Gotch was his name. And Chester was always, every time I got there, he was always eating a salami sandwich. Chester Gotch must have had 30, maybe 40 salami sandwiches with him a day. He just mainlined salami. And I'd come in and old Gotch is sitting there eating a salami sandwich on rye, in case you're interested in the details, a little touch of mustard. And uh, he is sitting there looking out of this glass cage at all these, all these bimbos out there flipping the glass and flipping the tin, you know. They flip the tin, they look in at Chester, see. Oh, I tell you, in those blue uniforms, they were, see, they were specially cut blue uniforms because if they were loose, it was kind of dangerous because they would catch a sheet of tin on them. They'd cut them all up, see. So these were real tight blue uniforms. And these girls were extremely glandular. They're flipping it up, you know. And, and, and Chester sitting there all the time eating the, eating the salami sandwich. Well, every time I'd come in here, I want to tell you, I'd come in there, you know, and who, boy, my, I had safety glasses, see, I had to wear safety glasses. I, just going through that field of these fantastic women, my safety glasses were clouded up with passion. Well, I come in there every day, and I always look forward to coming to that office. 
And it was only one trip a day. I'd make that office and I'd come in there and I'd lay the mail down. I'd say, hi, Chester. They'd say, what you got today? You always the same thing. You know, the, w work, they sort of develop a whole routine. What you got today? And I'd say, oh, just a couple things, Chester. Here's the milling load, the mill loading. And then I would turn around and I would go out and I would always adjust my safety glasses and I had this big yellow safety helmet on and I'd run through that crowd of women. Uh, yeah. I remember one called Sophie Subiak. Sophie Subiak. And right next to her was her friend Helen. And every time I'd go past, these two chicks would go, Hiya, buddy, hiya. You know? <laughs> we had a thing going, you know, how's it going? Why don't you come down some night after work? And she, well, here I was. It, was. it was an unbelievable stroke of fate. Good fortune. Fantastic stroke. I am being assigned to the tin mill assorting office, me. I said, when do I go out there, Mr. Moss? You report tomorrow morning at 8. I said, what am I going to do out there? Because there was only three guys in this office. It was Chester, it was Mr. Kennedy, and a guy named Herman who would sit in the back and go, he had a, st a, a punch. And all day long, he's just going, <laughs> he's pounding on cards. I don't know what he was doing. He's, <laughs> he's pounding his cards. So I, I said, what am I going to do? He said, I don't know. He says, you go out and, and, and report to Mr. Gotch. I said, report to Mr. Gotch. And he says, yep. I said, why no, Mr. Gotch? That's Chester. He says, well, you report to Mr. Gotch. You're working for Mr. Gotch. And at that point, he pulls his hat down. He goes back to work. That means he's dismissing me. You know how bosses, when they're, when they're turning you off, see? Well, I'm all excited. See, I go into, I go into the mail room and I say, hey, Freddie. Freddie was my mail, you know, my, 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 my boy, Fred. See, me and Freddie worked the, the roots together. So I says, hey, Freddie, I'm, I'm getting a sign. He said, where are you going? I said, 10 mil a sortie. He said, oh, my God, no kidding. Permanent? I said, I don't know. I'm going to work in the 10 mil a sorting office. He said, with all those chicks. I said, that's right. Well, it was double jackpot. You know, it was like getting, it was like, you know, getting, getting assigned to heaven. Uh, you're in charge of harp strings or something, you know? So I said, uh, well, Last day here, Chet. You know, I'll see you, old Freddie. I'll, so I'll see you tomorrow. You know, I'll, I'll drop by. I said, you know, at lunchtime. You know, that's a. They only work eight to five there. You know. Of course, in the mail room, we worked. <laughs> oh God, what hours! And I said, I'll come down for lunch. See, that was about a block away from the mail room. And so the next morning, I am all dressed up. I've got my new corduroy jacket that I got at Sears. See, I'm going to work in the in the office there. See, and I got myself a nice shirt. And I even, I even, to, to make sure, you know, I, I put it on real good. See, I got myself one of these ties, you know, to clip on that they wear in the mill. See, I got a tie. And I didn't even have to wear safety shoes there. That, that's the, in the mill, it was considered a real, real status symbol. If you got a job that you didn't have to wear safety shoes, that meant that you were moving up the ladder. <laughs> so I, I show up, you know, at the five minutes to eight, and all the chicks are coming to work. See, and they got their blue uniforms on, all that. Green lights are being lit in the yellow lights. And then I see Sophie over there and I see Helen. And I wave to Sophie. How are you, Sophie? And she gives me the eye, see? Cause she's not used to seeing me there at that hour. I used to just come running through with the mail, see? She gives me the eye. So I walk, I casually walk over and say, hey, Sophie. And she says, yeah, what? Yeah, well, yes. And I said, Sophie, I'm working here. She says, here? What are you doing? I said, well, I don't know. I'm working, uh, Mr. Gotch's assistant, I'm working there in the 10 mill sorting office. She says, oh, well, I'll see you later. She takes that big glove and she flips a big piece of tin in my face. When I walk into the office, and there's Chet sitting there. This time he does not say, what do you got for me today? He just looks up and he said, uh, you're two minutes late. I said, well, I, I was just out talking to Sophie. He said, Sophie, you mean the big broad down there on number 12? I said, yeah. She's all right. He says, well, you ready to go? And at that, he turns around and he looks over at Herman. See, the guy sitting in the van. He says, hey, Herman. What do you think he's going to do? And with that, Herman says, well, we'll see. And Chet Gotch says, all right. He says, 
over there. He says, your stuff is at the bottom of the file cabinet, the green file cabinet, the one over by the wall. He says, your stuff's in the bottom drawer. I said, what stuff? So he just opened it up and he said, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what to do. So I walk over there. I figure I'm going to have a desk, you know, like all the other guys in the office. I'm going to have a desk, a telephone, my little name on the thing, you know. <laughs> Mail's going to come to me. This is the, you know, I, you, you always have these dreams of glory, you know. So I walk over and I open up the bottom of the file cabinet. There's a whole pile of stuff in there, cans of stuff and this, this. I said, what's this stuff? He said, well, look over behind the cans. He says, get those things out of there. So I reach in behind the cans. I can't believe what I got. Behind the cans, there's about 15 big rat traps. I said, you mean these rat traps, Chuck? He says, yeah, bring them out. I said, well, okay. Want me to clean out the file cabinet, huh? He said, no, just bring out the stuff. That's your stuff. <laughs> I says, oh, you mean this is my stuff? He says, yeah. Bring the, bring the rat traps over here. He said, I want to show you something. And so I take the rat traps. There's about 15 of them. You know, have you ever seen rat traps? These are biggies. You know, the biggies. You know, the kind with the big metal thing that goes bam, you know. These are rat traps. About 15, you know, with the wooden base. About 15 wooden rat traps with a big rubber band around them. And there's a lot of cans of stuff in the back there, see. So I take the rat traps and I put them on Chet Gotch's desk. And he's chewing away on his first salami sandwich of the day, you know. And he says, all right. He says, no. So you ever work a rat trap? I said, no. <laughs> I've never worked a rat. I said, we, I, I, I messed around with mouse traps once in a while. He said, works the same way. It works the same way. He said, here, give me one of them. He puts the sandwich down. He takes the rat trap and he goes, <laughs> You know, he bends this thing back and goes, <coughs> he says, now here, you take this, this little metal tongue here, see, and you put it down and you hold it over the rat trap. Hold, hold it down with your thumb. It's stronger than hell. He says, now, you, be, be sure you hold tight on it because it's going to get your hand, you know. Hold it down and you put it in that little ring there, like that, see. Now it's set. Now that rat trap is set. He says, now watch. So he takes his pencil, see, he says, watch this now. And he puts it down on the desk, see, he says, now watch. And he touches the rat trap. Bap! Bam, you know, and toss that pencil right in half. <laughs> you know, I jump back. He says, all right now, see? If you touch, if the rat comes over and touches that little tongue sticking out there, he's going to get trapped. Now, what you do is you put the bait on that tongue. I want you to set these rats, rat traps. He says, now I want you to, that's, your, that's what you're going to do. You're going to catch the rats around here. I said, I'm catching rats? He says, yep. And you know, I'll tell you this. He said, if you're as good as Stanley, you're going to be damn good. I said, Stanley? He said, Stanley, yeah. Well, he said, Stanley was here this spring catching rats. Best rat catcher we ever had. It's fantastic. Got promoted up to the main office. I said, Stanley got promoted to the main office? And Herman then chimes in in the back and he says, listen, kid, if you catch rats half as good as Stanley, you're going to be damn good. Well, I never saw this Stanley, see. Now, already I'm working under the legend. It's so terrible to replace a great performer. I mean, it really is, you know. I mean, I mean, can you imagine the poor character, you know, who, who had to come in and, and fill in for Mickey Mandel? I mean, you sit down at the end of the bench, <laughs> and the crowd's hollering, We want Mickey! We want Mel! They ain't hollering for Herman or Fred, who's just come up from Rochester to replace him. Well, here I am, you know, already, you know, I'm knocked on this, this, the great legendary Stanley. So I said, well, what do I do? He says, well, what do you mean, what do you do? You catch rats. That's what you do. He says, now, where, I said, I said, where are the rats? He says, well, they're out there by the, the tracks down there by the shipping dock. He says, there's rats around the back. He says, you know what, you know what these damn girls do? He says, they eat their lunch and then they throw all the bread, all the bread, uh, crusts and all that junk around. He says, these rats come in here. He says, the place is full of them now. He says, your job is to catch rats. He says, that's your job. He said, I don't, he said, I don't, you know, go find Stanley, ask him where he caught him. Stanley, you want know to catch rats? Well, there I am, I'm on my own. So, <laughs> Chester wants to have nothing to do with catching rats, you know, the great Stanley come in and catch the rats. See, so, I says, all right. So I said, where do I get the bait? Ah, oh, bait. He says, what do you mean, where do you get the bait? He says, why don't you, he says, go down to the commissary and ask him for some bait. Stanley, he says, Stanley didn't bother me with his stuff. 
Oh, jeez, that damn Stanley. So I, 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 we had a commissary down at the end of the mill. See, so I go down to the end of the mill, and, and in there, all these guys eat. You know, they say, okay, we're gonna, you know, clear a cafeteria type place. So I walk in, I'm looking around for the guy. I used to deliver mail to this guy down there. See, there was a guy named Mr. Roberts I delivered the mail to. So I says, Mr. Roberts here. And uh, they thought I was a mail boy coming in, see. So the girl says, oh, uh, Mr. Roberts, the mail boy's here. So Mr. Roberts comes out. He says, "What do you want?" I said, "Well, I want some some rat, some some rat bait." She want what? I said, "I want rat bait." She says, "Rat bait? What are you going to do with rat bait on a mail route?" I said, "I'm working down here at the tin mill sorting office, and I work for Mr. Gotch, and I need some rat bait." She says, "You're replacing Stanley." And I said, "Yeah." His black kid was fantastic. The great Stanley. <laughs> I never saw this character. The great Stanley again. So he says, "Well, look." He says, uh, "He says I'll get you some of the stuff." You know, Stanley had his own way. You know, he says, "I'll, I'll." What do you want? I says, "Well, gee, what do I have to eat? How about some cheese? You know, some some uh, some old hamburger or something like that." He says, "Well, okay." He says, uh, "Hey, Madge, fix up some of that stuff that Stanley used to use." Stanley had his own bait. And so she goes in the back, and about five minutes later, she comes walking out. And what has she got? Now, listen to what she used, to, what, what, what Stanley invented. See, already I'm, I'm working under the great Stanley. Stanley would take old hamburger, you know, like stuff that has not been used. It's, you know, it gets a little gamey. And, and he would have this chick grind up old cheese ends, you know, these hard ends of, of cheese. And he would grind them together with the, with the old Gave me, gave me meatloaf and make little balls out of them. Really gave me stuff, see? And she comes out with a, with a cellophane bag full of these little balls. And I said, what is this? She says, that's what Stanley, Stanley used to have me make these for him. And I said, what is it? She says, well, it's hamburger and old cheese. And she says, keep them in there. And she says, the, the older they get, the better they are. I said, okay. So I go out with my little bag of bait. <laughs> I go down. I don't know what I'm going to do. See the first thing. So I, 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 I start walking around down by the tracks, seeing. So uh, I, I, I set a couple of traps. I put a thing in there, you know. I put the bait in. I get it down. All of a sudden, I put down by the tracks. And I put one under the, under the. They had a big uh, cardboard cutting table. I put one under the cutting table, and I put one in the back where we, where we threw out all the waste paper. And I walked up and down. It was a coke machine we had. I put one back in the coke machine, and. uh I, I start going back now. I put all fifteen of them on. See, so I come back. I walk back into the into the office, and I said to to Chester, I says, "Oh, all my traps are on. Cause don't don't bother me with it. That's your job. Don't come in and tell me your troubles. I got my own troubles." <laughs> and he's on the phone. So what am I supposed to do? See, at this point, so uh, I sort of hang around a little bit, and then I I figure the better the best thing to do is to stay out of their sight. So I go walking back out, and I go over, you know, and I look at Sophie, and she's flipping a tin, flipping the old tin. So I said, how are you, Sophie? She said, uh, all right, flipping a tin. She's looking at me. She says, uh, say, can I ask you a question? I said, yes, baby. She says, where's Stanley? Stanley! I said, I don't know where Stanley is. He got transferred to the main office. She says, if you see him, tell him Sophie was asking for him. Stanley's not only the greatest rat catcher that the tin mill ever saw, but he's also making it with the chicks. So I go back out by the tracks and I start looking at my traps. You know, I'm walking, I'm walking my trap line. <laughs> Any of you ever walked your trap line? Well, the first three, the first three traps, nothing. The fourth trap, the one back by the in the back, we threw all the wastebasket stuff out. See, we had a big, big garbage heap back there. That last, that fourth one, it's been sprung. No rat. And no cheese. It is gone. Well, I said, son of a gun. See, so I'm putting more stuff in there, and I load it up again. See, and I put that baby down under the waste paper, and I start going around. Well, by God, I couldn't believe it. I'm walking on my, I'm walking on the, 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 the trap line. I get over by the Coke machine. I caught a rat. There was a rat in the Coke machine. Yeah, there it was. A little rat, you know, he's about two inches long. I caught a rat, see. So I whip it out, you know, I got a rat. Well, I take the rat, see, and I take it back into the office. At which point Chester got just get that thing out of here!
man. Don't bring them rats in here. What are you bringing a rat in here for? I said, well, I want to show you I caught a rat. He says, don't bring it in here. Throw it in the back of the garbage. Don't bring it in there. Oh, God, get that rat out of here. So I walk out with my trophies. Say, well, that day, the first day, I caught six rats on my trap line. Six rats. And I kept careful score. Well, the next day, I come in. This time, I'm, I'm all excited. Somehow, this stuff started to get to me. So the next day, I come in right away, 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm not messing around with Sophie and that. I start laying my traps. It's like a game, see? <laughs> well, by noon, I had caught maybe seven or eight rats. I'm beginning to get wise to where them babies are. And by that night, I must have caught 20, 25 rats. And I kept score. I, I marked down on a, on a pad how many I caught and why I caught them. See, I got a coke machine. <laughs> Do <Duo>, see? <laughs> Back up by the number two cardboard cutting machine three. So I keep keep the score. Well, by the end of the week, I can hardly wait to get to work every day. I would come in every morning, <laughs> and then is the day that I hit the jackpot. Fantastic day! I caught about thirty or forty rats. And so that night, I'm back, you know, I'm back at home, and I'm sitting there at the kitchen table. I'm feeling really great, see. I'm sitting at the kitchen table. I'm feeling on top of it, see. My old man says, Gene, you know, what, what's eating you? You look like you got a fantastic, hot, you know, heavy day tonight. I says, no, I had a good day at work. He says, what happened? I said, I caught 36 rats today. He says, 36 rats in one day? I said, yep. He says, that's not bad. He said, listen, I got a tip for you. He says, you know what rats really like? He says, we always have them down at the plant. I said, what? He says, rats like nothing better than rotten liver. He says, get some rotten liver down at, down at, <laughs> down at Osher Sliders and you'll catch more rats than you ever believe. So that Monday, I get myself some rotten liver at Osher Sliders. I take it to work. And by nightfall, oh my God, I had 40, 50 rats. And by the end of the week, I came in. I caught maybe 75 rats in one day. And I walk into the Tid Miller sorting office, and Chet looks up and says, You know, you're even better than Stanley. I said, Oh, nothing to it. Herman says, Yeah, he's pretty good. He's damn near as good as Stanley. And I walked out on the Tid Mill floor that day, tall and straight. I walked up to Sophie, and I said, Sophie, how about going over to the Red Eagle with me tonight after work? She says, where's Stan? I says, the hell with Stan. I'm moving in. You going? She says, well, you put it that way, yes. And she did. You are listening to one of the truly great rat catchers to come out of Inland Steel. A legend. And even today, kids are being measured against me. But I ain't tipping them to that liver trick. That's what really did it. You know, we professionals keep our secrets.